Well, hello, congregation, family and friends, and Bereans. I pray that all is well with you. Thank you for joining me for the Thursday broadcast. Uh, we were having signal problems earlier, so hopefully this is going out okay. If you can let me know, uh, that would be a wonderful thing. Make sure that you put a like on the video if it's blessing you. Please make sure that you have subscribed to the YouTube channel and also that you're inviting others so we can reach more and more people with the gospel of Christ. Over here on Facebook, make sure that you're following me uh, and also invite other people to join us here at Living in Harmony Ministries. Well, we are going to court tonight. If you have your Bibles, Bereans, and I know you do, we're in Micah chapter 6. We're going into God's courtroom tonight, and we're going to be indicted by God. Well, first of all, we need to understand, what is an indictment? What does that mean? An indictment happens when there's certain evidence against a person or a group of people, and the charges are brought before uh, a, an attorney or district attorney, a prosecutor, and then an indictment is issued. It's a case against someone. It's a formal charge, if you will, against someone. And of course, those charges have to be proven in a court of law here in America, and that's how it's supposed to work. You bring the charges forward, a jury or a judge hears that, they make that decision as to whether the person is guilty or innocent, and then it proceeds from there whether sentence needs to be passed, etc. Well, we are going to be hauled into God's courtroom tonight in Micah chapter 6. We're going to be looking very briefly at the first eight verses of it, uh, with hopefully some practical application for all of us, because the title of this message is God's Indictment upon us all. Yes, that means you, and that means me. Now, we may be looking at this. Hey, by the way, can you find Micah? It's right after the book of Jonah. It's the sixth of the 12 uh, minor prophets. Jonah is number five, and then Micah is number six. Micah is not preached on a lot, at least in my experience. And Sister Tawana, if you're watching this, or will be watching this, if we haven't read the book of Micah lately, you should put it on our schedule so that we can go ahead and read those chapters. Micah is an important book. A quick background about who Micah was. He was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah and Hosea. Uh, it was uh, he was around seven to eight hundred years before Christ came here, and most scholars believe that his writings were between seven hundred and seven thirty five b c and some of the book was talking about once uh, Jerusalem fell to the Assyrians in seven seventy two well we 're going to be going into god 's courtroom because he 's hauling us in there, and we have to give an account for our life. You know, Jesus talked about that in the New Testament, that we one day we will stand before God and we have to give an account for our life. And every idle word that we've spoken, that we spoke in our life, will be judged by God. So, if you are with me in Micah chapter 6, I want you to picture a courtroom. Now, in a courtroom, there are several principal players, right? Of course, you have the judge, and then you have the prosecutor, you have the defense attorney and the defendant, and in most cases you have a jury. Of course you have other people like those that are taking the notes and you have an audience and so on, but those four principles are always involved. You have a jury and a prosecutor and a defendant and the judge. Well, I'm going to show you here as we go through these verses exactly how God's courtroom works. So let's go back to Micah chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. This is God speaking. God is saying this first. He says, hear now what the Lord is saying. This is God himself talking. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. That is God. You can imagine God sitting up on the dais, God looking down in his courtroom, and he's saying, arise and plead your case. Let me hear what your case is. But before we get to plead our case, the charges have to be brought before. So Micah now speaks in verse 2. Micah says, listen, you mountains, to the indictment or the case or the charge of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case or an indictment against his people, even with Israel 
he will dispute. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things here. First of all, why is Micah talking to the mountains and the foundations of the earth? These are immovable objects. These are immovable objects, unlike human beings, where we change. We, he, God is speaking to the very foundation of the earth, the very foundation of creation, the very foundation, the mountains and the foundation of the earth. He wants everybody to hear this indictment. And that's why it's against all of us. Now, you may say, now, wait a minute. This is an Old Testament book. He's a minor prophet. It's something obscure. How does this possibly relate to us? Well, I want to show you something. You see where it says here? Because the Lord has a case against his people. And you may say, well, that just means national Israel. It just means the Israelites, because this was on the Old Testament side of the ledger here. And it says he has, even with Israel, he will dispute. Yes, in an historical context, he's talking about national Israel. He's talking about Israel and Judah. But in a greater context, are we not also his people, those of us who are true believers? We cannot be exempt. We cannot look at this and be exempt and say, well, God's not talking about us because he's talking about strictly something that happened in the Old Testament. That would be wrong. That would be a misinterpretation. And we would miss what God has for us this evening. And so Micah stands up and he gives us these things. Listen, listen. And now we've got to go to the next part because what happens? Because now the jury has to be informed of what the charges are against the defendant. Before the defendant can take the stand in their own defense, if they do that, and in this particular case, in this courtroom, God is going to allow us, Israel, allow the, his defendant to defend themselves and you're going to see in just a few verses how futile it is absolutely futile of the defense that they bring they are guilty the same way that we are guilty and i hope to be able to show you that clearly but now the jury has to be told this listen to this in verse three here my people what have i done to you and how have i wearied you answer me these are there's two questions here that are asked god is asking these questions here he's saying what have i done to you and how have i wearied you it's actually the reverse we weary god don't we neither one of these questions that god is answering and he's asking he's saying you answer me and neither one of them can be answered in a negative way god has only done good for us for ancient Israel and for even us today. I don't care what's happening in the world. I don't care what's happening in our lives as far as calamities and so on. Because a lot of it, let's be honest, a lot of the things that's happening in our life is from our own mistakes, our own choices, our own decisions, our own stubbornness, our own rebelliousness. God has given us everything. God has given us nothing but good. He's going to point out a couple of examples here coming up to ancient Israel of what he did for them. What has God done in your life? What has he done in my life? Well, the greatest thing he's done is given us the Lord Jesus Christ. Because without Jesus, there's no eternal life. Without Jesus, there's no forgiveness of sins. Without Jesus, there's no hope. All of us would be condemned to an eternity without God. So what has God done for us? Can we go around and say, God, you did this and you did that and it's all negative? No, we cannot say that. So God's asking, he says, my people? Yes, he's talking to national Israel, but he's talking to you and I too. My people, Thomas and whoever's watching, what have I done to you? We need to answer honestly, God, what have you done to us? And how have I wearied you? Answer me. God is demanding an answer, and we will have an opportunity to give an answer before God as to what we feel he's done for us or to us or wearied us or not wearied us. And it all depends on how we think about all of this and how we see God in our life. And when God gets to the, the payoff verse, I, I call it, in verse 8, the verse that we all know, and the, the words we can all probably quote, and when's the last time we actually went through all of this to look at it? Well, we're going to look at that tonight because it contains the answer to the dilemma that we're all facing. And it's a way to get us out of God's indictment and to be made clean again before him. And so as we're looking at this, we're now being informed, the jury is being informed of the charges against the defendant. 
Now, God begins to lay out his case now. Look in verse 4. Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and ransomed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now, Berans, I'm going to give you some scripture references. We can't look at all of them, but part of what we do is we give you scripture references, and then you look them up for yourself and make sure that you're studying all of this. Well, of course he brought them up out of Egypt. We know about that. You can read about, first of all, the call of Moses and Aaron. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 16. Write it down. That's where Moses has that encounter after the burning bush. And then Moses makes all those excuses. And I don't speak right. And God says, I want to send Aaron with you. Well, read Exodus 4, and you'll find out why God said this. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, brother and brothers and a sister. He also says, I delivered you out of the land of Egypt, away from slavery. They were in Egypt as slaves for over 400 years. You can read about that in Exodus 12, specifically verses 50 and 51, where God says, I brought you out. And as you read about the Exodus, when, when Moses opens the seas through the power of God, remember? And then the Israelites, uh, the Egyptians are following after them, Pharaoh and his army, and the water falls over them. You know that story. Did God do bad to his people, or did God do nothing but good for his people? God is laying out his case. The jury is hearing this. And God is saying, I've done this good thing for you. I did that good thing for you. Because if we dare to say, God, I blame you for this and I blame you for that, we, no, we cannot do that. So God is making his case here. Look at verse 5. Here's another reference I want to give you. He says, my people, my people again. He's talking to us, not just Israel. He's talking to us. Remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him? And from Shatim to Gilgal, so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. You remember that story. At least you should, Bereans. We're talking about the story that happened in Numbers 22, 23, and 24. Write those chapters down and make sure that you're looking at that. If you haven't read that recently. You remember that Balaam was a prophet. And Balak, the king, tried to bribe Balaam with some money to curse the Israelites. You remember that? And Balaam said, I'm not going to say anything that God hasn't said. Well then, but he came up with a scheme, didn't he? He came up with a scheme where he was able to lead the Israelites into sin. And as a result of that, God had to bring judgment against the Israelites. Read that story. But it, God held back those curses from his people. And as you read, he says here, People, remember now what Balak king of Moab counseled, what he wanted to do, and what Balaam son of Beor answered him, so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. Remember, it was the talking donkey that talked. Read it, Bereans, Numbers 22, 23, and 24. Now, there's the charges brought against. The jury is now heard. Now, we have the situation where the defendant, you and I, the defendant gets to respond. We now get a chance to talk. In some courtrooms and in some cases, the defendant does not take his or her to stand in their own defense. Sometimes the attorney does not let them do that. But in this case, God, through the prophet Micah, is allowing the defendant, Israel, and in a greater sense, us, to plead our case. We have to have a defense. God, you're bringing all these charges against us. And here's what they say. And I want you to see how utterly, what do I want to say? Utterly useless this defense is. And how often do you and I use these useless excuses against God? When God convicts us of something, when God says, this is wrong, and we say, but God, but suppose I do this or I do that. Remember, we can't earn our way into God's good graces. We can't earn or work our way into heaven. But I want you to see what the Israelites said beginning in verse 6. Now they start wondering to themselves because now the case is brought out before them. So they ask this question in verse 6. With what shall I come to the Lord and how myself before and bow myself before the God on high? What, how can I do that? What could I possibly do to give the God in return for his continuous blessings? Whoa, but 
the defendant comes up with another question here. Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? They are calves that are a year old. Now, you know, as through the Old Testament, that they would bring sacrifices, to sacrifice to God. Israel is still thinking at this point, should I come to him with burnt offerings? Is that going to, is that going to do the job? Should I bring him these young calves and sacrifice them? Is that going to do the job? Well, they're thinking incorrectly. And so they go on in verse 7 here. It says, Does the Lord take the light in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Can I do those things? See, these are more, these are more questions. When it says, shall I present my firstborn, didn't God do that for us? Through the Lord Jesus Christ, didn't God do that for us by presenting the firstborn? Jesus is called the firstborn from the dead. Well, these are all fruitless questions. How many times do you and I come to God with, with things like this? If I just do a little bit more for you, if I just offer a little bit more, if I just sacrifice a little bit more. See, those things are okay, but it's not the answer. You'll notice here that God does not say, yes, that's what I want. I want more sacrifices. I want more calves and lambs killed. I want rivers of oil. I want all of these things that you can give me. Do you think God needs all of that? No, he doesn't. He doesn't need any of that. But what does God say? What are we supposed to do? Think of us in, in this modern world, you and I right now. What is it that we can do? to appease God, to serve God better? Do we have to think, well, I, I've got to tithe a little bit more. I have to pray a little bit more. Maybe I should attend church more times. Maybe, no. While all of those things have their merit, that is not what God is talking about. That's not what he means right now. The answer are three things that we've heard many times, and maybe you've actually heard this verse preached on. And it's verse 8. Here's where the indictment comes in. Here's where Israel was guilty. And here's where you and I are guilty. And look, we, we need to take an honest look at ourselves. This is where all of us are guilty. You and I are not exempt from this. I talk about myself first, including you as well. I don't go pointing fingers at you unless I'm pointing a finger at me first. This indictment from Almighty God applies to me just as much as it applies to you. It applies to every human being. And there are three things that God is talking about here in verse 8. Remember, we talked about earlier where God was saying, look at all these good things I do. And then verse 6 and 7, mankind or the defendant comes back at God and says, well, we can give you this or maybe we can give you that. No. This is what God says in verse 8. Here's the indictment. Here's where all of us, the charges, we're guilty of all of this. He has told you, O oh man, not just ancient Israel, O oh man, Thomas and you. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. Here are three things that are good. What does God require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Require. It's a requirement. It's not an option. It's a requirement. And if you and I, before I get to them, if you or I neglect any of these three things, we are disobeying what God has required us to do. See, a requirement is not a request. It is an order, if you will. This is a requirement. This is something that you must do. It is not an option. You don't do it one day and not do it the next day. That's not the way it works. So here's the three things, and let's be convicted together, okay? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? Number one, to do justice. Two, to love kindness. Three, to walk humbly with your God. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard. Obviously, in the King James, it says to do justice or to do justly. First of all, we need to, what does it mean to do justice? To live right? To live right in our relationship to fellow man? It's how we act. It's how we behave as God would have us to do. 
Can we say that in this world there is justice? Can we say that in our society right now that there is justice? There's justice to a degree. But because of the way some things are set up, are we doing justice? And we need to look at this in a corporate sense, a big sense, as his people, as his church, as his body, as his bride of Christ. But we also need to look at it on a smaller level. You and me specifically. So if I'm going to do justice, there are some people uh, who protest. There are some people who get into political office and they try to change some of the laws that are in place. There are others that demand that certain laws are dismantled and rebuilt again so that justice, justice means for every single person. You see, if, if you or I look upon a certain person of a certain color and we think they're inferior to us or they're not as smart as us or they're not as entitled, if you look at someone that way or think of someone that way or if I do it, that, that is not doing justice. Justice is treating everyone equally. Remember what the golden rule is that Jesus said? We are to treat others as we want to be treated. You don't want to be treated mean or, or be oppressed or be depressed down or have so a society against you because of how you look or how you talk or where you came from then you're not doing justice. You're not participating in that justice at all. We're to act, we're to behave, we're to think just as Jesus did. When you look through the Gospels, Jesus treated everyone the same. Yes, did he rebuke the Pharisees and Sadducees? Yes, he did. Because they were pompous and they were wrong and he needed to correct them. So he did do that. But did he treat the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John, any different than he treated his own disciples? Any different than he treated the Roman soldiers that were coming to arrest him? No. Jesus is our role model. Jesus is the person that we are to emulate. We are to be as Christ-like as possible. And so, if you and I are looking at this person, or that culture, or this race of people, and we're saying we're better than them, or we want to make laws that are unequal so that we stay up here and they stay down there. We're not doing justice. We're not doing it in the church. We're not speaking out about it in the church. We're not bringing these things that are happening in this world, like systemic racism, like social injustices against people of color. Those things are being talked about, but then after, as the furor dies down, it gets swept under the rug until the next incident happens. That's not doing justice. That's putting it on the front burner for a while. Maybe a few little things change, and then we go back to life as normal, business as usual. That is not what God is talking about. These are daily things that we are to be doing. God nowhere says here, only do justice and love mercy and kindness on Sundays or on Wednesdays when you come to Bible study. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying we are to do it, and it's something that is good. The second one, it says here, to love kindness. The King James says, you know, to love mercy, which is another synonym for kindness. How can we, can we love God and can we love each other without having God's mercy upon someone? Do you remember when the person came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, what was the greatest commandments of the law? What did he say? First of all, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And number two, to love each other, to love one another. Can we do that? Are we doing that? We're failing. All of us are failing. All of us have biases. All of us have life experiences that have jaded how we speak. Some of humanity have suffered much more than others. There's no doubt about it. But if we are to love mercy, we are to love it. We are to be kind with one another. We are to be merciful upon one another. And I will tell you, on a personal level, it's something that I fail at. I don't always have mercy upon people. I don't always have that forgiving, that forgiving spirit against people, particularly ones who hurt me or come after my family. 
I don't have that. It's a fault. It's a sin. It's an indictment against me. And it's an indictment against you as well. Because you can't say, you can't look in the mirror and say that, oh, I treat everybody. No, we cannot do that because we all have a sinful nature. All of us have these flaws in us. That's why God, it's like he's holding a mirror up to us and he's saying, listen, while you're being a defendant, while I'm bringing this indictment against you, what are you going to do about it? Because these three things you are guilty of, human race. Now, there's a third thing he says here. He says, we're also to walk humbly with the Lord or before the Lord, I believe the King James tells us. But what does that mean? Just to be humble before the Lord. It means getting rid of egos. It means stop thinking that we're better than someone else. Listen, Almighty God created us. And if we're not walking, how dare any of us elevate ourselves to a point where we think we're something more than what we are? We happen to live in a society that, that, that tells us that get all the riches you can, get all the power you can, and the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. You know that. We live in a society that... that, that rewards wealthy people and penalizes poor people. I'm just saying what it is. And if you're rich and you have a lot of money, you have a lot of influence, you are up here. And if you're poor and you don't have money and you don't have influence, you're down here. And the fact of the matter is the people up here are doing whatever they can to keep the people down here, down here. How is being up here and having these inflated egos and these people that think more of themselves than what they should, and that money talks and power talks. How is that walking humbly before God? How is that actually, there's no repentance of sin when we do that. When we think we can do things without God, when we think that we can solve problems without God. Look at this, look at this, this COVID-19 situation. How many times have you seen in the news upon reports, how many people have invoked the name of God in helping us to find a cure, a vaccine? No. We hear a lot about science, and we hear a lot about medicine, and we hear a lot of politicians talk a lot of stuff, and there is some movement here and there, but by and large, you don't hear people or see people on their knees pleading before God saying, God, this is a pestilence. This is a worldwide pandemic. No matter what some people think, it is a worldwide pandemic. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people are being killed. It's like a plague from the Old Testament. But do we hear people say, God, have mercy upon us. God, uh, l let us repent before you and lift this from us. God could lift it from us instantly. But do we see that? No. Because we don't do the three things that God is telling us that are good. We don't do justice. And we don't love mercy or love kindness. And we certainly don't walk humbly before God. We should be on our knees, on our face, in sackcloth and ashes, before the Almighty God saying, God, forgive us for what we're doing. But no. No. The games continue. The games continue. How are... How... How could we do, unless we lose ourselves... Collectively, Christian church, Christian church, and I'm part of the clergy as well. We are all guilty of not bringing these truths to the people and not asking the people, a matter of fact, demanding that we repent. Remember, and I use this example a lot, but it, it is apt in this point. You remember when Jonah was sent to Nineveh? What happened in Jonah chapter 3? From the king on down, he was in sackcloth, he sat in ashes, they repented, and God relented of what he was going to do with them because the indictment against them is they were guilty, and in 40 days they were going to be destroyed. But because they repented, at that time God relented, he changed his mind, he didn't destroy them, they all survived. Do we do that? I preached not long ago a message about where are today's sackcloth and ashes. Where are we? If we're not doing these three things in verse 8, then all of us are guilty and all of us, that indictment should be on all of us. And yes, we stand guilty before God, myself included. 
So what can we do corporately? The church has to get their act together. The church has been silent for too long. There's only certain things. There's only certain topics that the church will talk about that's maybe PC or politically correct or what's going to get votes or whatever you want to call it. The church should not be politicized. The church is the church. It's the body of Christ and it should be preaching what the Bible says and what God says and nothing else. But we, individually, what can we do? So I'm looking at this and I challenge you also. What can you do in these three cases? What can you do to make a difference? And you're like, what are you going to do in your personal law when it comes to doing justice? For myself, as I continue to be woke, as I continue to see what's happening, I can speak out on forums like this. I can start to change my mind and change my heart and change my very soul and what I think about certain things and certain people and my reaction to them. If I want to love kindness or love mercy, I've got to start showing kindness and mercy. And I can just confess to you that that is an issue that I have. And I confess that before you. Can you confess that also? We can't go around saying we love every single person because none of us love every single person. All of us are guilty. All of us have fallen under this indictment of God. We don't love mercy. We don't love kindness. We do if it affects us or people we love or people we care about. But not that guy over there. I don't like him. God shouldn't have mercy on him. He's a lousy person. He's bad news. Come on, we all think that way. And if we're going to walk humbly before God, we better understand that the God who spoke this universe into being, do you understand that all of us, whenever our time is, every single one of us, we're going to be standing before Almighty God. You alone and me alone. We are going to be standing before the judgment throne of God and we have to give an account for our life. That is not the time for us to say, God, could you send us back a second time and we could get this thing right. We have one chance. We have one chance here. And when you stand before an almighty God and we have nothing to say to him because we didn't walk humbly. We didn't pay attention to his commandments. We weren't as Christ-like. We didn't share his gospel. There was all kinds of things we didn't do down here, and we will give an account for that one day. I will too. We all need to repent. We all need to repent before Almighty God and to just look at these three things. This is our indictment tonight because God has indicted all of us. It's not just for a certain culture, not just for certain people. It's for all of us. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of the things in verse 8. Can you say that you're guilty too? And if so, what are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? How are we going to change? We need to go to Almighty God and repent of all of these sins, of all of these times and these things that we think about, the things that we do that are wrong. We don't treat someone justly. And when we don't love God's mercy, Jesus showed mercy and kindness. Why can't we? We need to do that. And most of all, we need to walk humbly before Almighty God. I pray, I, pray you've, I pray this disturbed you a little bit. It disturbed me. And we just scratched the surface here. We could go on and on, but I, I recognize our time as well. I, I encourage you, Bereans, like it says in Acts 17, 11, search the scriptures. Make sure what you heard was true. Go through this passage. Go through the other passages I gave you. Put this all together and make that checklist. God, here's where I've fallen down. I repent before you. Here's what I can do myself to improve in these areas and here's how I can help others see it too and for those of us in the church shame on us shame on us if anyone God's people should know better and you know what in many ways we're no better than the world who doesn't even believe shame on us we have repenting to do if this message has blessed you if it's disturbed you even if you don't like me right now that's okay God's word says in Isaiah 55, 11, his word will not return void. It reaches all those people he intends it to reach. If it reached you tonight, if this bothers you tonight, if this convicted you tonight, if this made you angry tonight, then you share it with someone else because we're all in the same boat. All of us, all of us are under this indictment and we've all been found guilty. We've all been, none of us walked out of God's courtroom with clean hands. We're all guilty. So share this video out. Put a like on it if it blessed you. Thank you to those who have been praying for this ministry. Um, 
This ministry is going through some changing times. I made an announcement the other day. There's We have a special broadcast series that's coming up. Crystal and I will be doing a series of joint broadcasts, and we just decided today it's going to happen in early October. Uh, we're, we're putting together the nuts and bolts of it. You will be notified of it. We will be sending you that information, and we hope that you'll be able to join us for about six weeks on a Monday morning. More to come on that. Please keep praying for this ministry as, as God leads us through a new season of challenges, not only with COVID-19, but also rebuilding the ministry and seeing what God would have us to do. And thank you to those of you who just very recently, within the last couple of days, have sent your offerings. It doesn't matter if it's a small offering or a bigger offering. It doesn't matter. You are giving to God's work. And when you give to this ministry, it goes right back into the ministry to help other people through a benevolence fund. Some of you, we've already helped through that fund. It goes to keep God's work going. So if God would lead you to support us financially, I'll be honest with you, we could use it. We sure could use it. A workman is worthy of his wages. I am a workman. This is what God has called me to do. I'm worthy of wages. Uh, but I leave that between you and God. If God would lead you to do it, there's four ways you can do it. PayPal, we have Cash App, we have Facebook Messenger, and of course we have Snail Mail. I will post all that. If you don't see it, please get in touch with me on how you can send an offering. But at the very minimum, please make sure you subscribe to YouTube. Please make sure you put a like on Facebook. And please keep those prayers coming for this ministry. We need it. Well, this is Thursday evening. If you're watching me live, we'll be back Sunday at 2 p.m. Central for our Sunday sermon, and then kick off a whole week of broadcast next week. Thanks for being with me tonight. God bless you.